Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome, welcome. Um, we're so excited to have this uh, panel together to talk, uh, I guess, jumpstarting your ML careers. I am not Saurabh, so uh, hopefully no one drops on the call now, um, but I'll do, I will do my best uh, to host this panel. So, um, okay, I'm just checking. Yep, no one, no one dropped, cool. Um, but the stars of the show um, are, are Shalvi, Kashik, and Frank, um, but I, I'll introduce them in a second, but just quickly on, on CoRISE. Um, we are an education platform that is aiming to transform the way professionals build uh, technical high demand skills. And uh, we do that by partnering with uh, world-class instructors or people really at the top of their field uh, like this panel. Um, and we do that as well through peer and social learning. And the format of the courses for those of you that um, are not currently in our platform is uh, a mix of live instructor sessions, um, real world projects. So most of the time you're spending time building um, hands on keyboard, not watching videos and taking quizzes, but actually building projects that would mirror what you would do in, on the job. And then we have a, a lot of uh, fireside chats and uh, discussions with operators who are experts in their fields, um, bringing in different perspectives like this chat today. Um, and yeah, our, the goal really is that everything is extremely practical. So people either running back to their, their desk to apply what they've learned or Maybe you're taking your projects and using them to talk through an interview um, as you think about transition careers. Um, so yeah, very excited to to introduce CoRISE and now um, you know really onto the show. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go in sort of order uh, of who I'm seeing. But uh, Kashik, um, I will not give your extended bios, but your short bios, and you can tell us a little bit more about yourself. But uh, Kashik is a, a technical leader and uh, content understanding team at Facebook. He holds um, several pat patents and published papers in search and recommendation, has over 10 years experience building AI-driven products um, at LinkedIn and uh, Google and Microsoft and as an early engineer at Passage AI. So thanks for joining us, Kashi. You can wave your hand. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. And uh, Shalvi is an AI scientist at SAP. Uh, she has experience being a data scientist, a software engineer, project manager and, and her focus has really been on deep learning, machine learning, um, NLP and, and data mining techniques. So wave, shall we? Cool. Hi, thanks <laughs> for having me here. Of course. Um, and Frank, last but not least. So Frank started his career as uh, the first engineer at Coursera. So Frank was a fun fact, was a sophomore in college when millions of people were using his uh, MOOC platform and he was running between uh, making sure the platform was up and finishing his uh, exams, um, uh, you know, multiple times a day. So, uh, and then he continued on to build Coursera's uh, really core infrastructure um, before moving on to Google Brain, um, and now is a founding engineer at CoRISE. So, thanks for joining us, Frank. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Awesome. Cool. So, um, let's jump right in. So, um, what I wanted to cover first, and maybe I'll, I'll go in order. Um, maybe I'll start with Shalvi. Um, Love to hear each of your journeys into sort of building data and ML systems. Um, just maybe talk about how how you got here to be doing this in your current roles. Um, Shavi, yeah, I'll start with you. Thanks, Jake, for handing that over. Um, so first of all, I I did my bachelor's in computer science and engineering, from, and I started back in 2013 doing that. So the first time I got the experience of working with data and data analysis was when I did my internship. I did my internship in Eurocom, Nice in South France. And there I had the task or the project was basically based on detecting telephonic fraud uh, and had to do data analysis for the same. And that was when I realized that this is really one very interesting topic, at least that interests me. And I thought that I could definitely do something more about it. Um, but then I got uh, into Samsung, I got my campus placement and I uh, started working at Samsung as a software engineer. So that means I was more focused on software development aspects, coding and stuff, but my data topic uh, was nowhere there. So I wanted to explore it more. Then I came for masters at TU Munich, um, just after one and a half year of working at Samsung. Um, and there in my masters, I studied data science. And here I was only focusing on the concept of data science because I knew I was happy with my internship, but I also wanted to make sure that I have the most important skills and concepts I gathered that from my masters. So, and I think the most fascinating stuff for me was that 
data science is not computer science. It's uh, computer science is just a tool helping for machine learning techniques and so on. But machine learning is mostly about mathematics. And that was when I realized I need to make my basics super strong in the first semester so that I can go ahead with it. And if it interests me, even then, then I can pursue my career in data science. And that's why I would recommend everyone here that mathematics is like the key for machine learning and deep learning, any, any kind of artificial intelligence techniques. And yeah. And that's when I, later after my master's, I also did my, um, during my master's, I also did part-time um, as a data scientist at Allianz. So I was also getting some industry experience there. And uh, my thesis actually helped me realizing that I'm really loving this field. I'm also, uh, which data, as a data scientist, I knew I would be able to also focus on research and development. So I wanted to pursue data scientist job in the end after my master's. And then I got the opportunity to work at SAP where I was, I'm now mostly focusing on researching different machine learning use cases for SAP and also developing them and productizing them in the end. So that's my journey. That's great. Thanks for taking us through that. Um, so um, maybe I'll kick it over to, to Kashik to tell us uh, your journey into building data and ML systems. Yeah, um, so I started with like a master's in computer science at Georgia Tech. Uh, like took a lot of uh, like ML courses there. Um, and I would, say, <clears throat> I would say around 2010, 2011, uh, it was slightly more harder to like, to like directly get into uh, like an ML job from like grad school. So like, uh, uh, but then I started working as a kind of like a data engineer or a data infrastructure engineer um, at Microsoft where I was part of the, the I mean, like the big, like the data mining team. Uh, we were building data pipelines to, to, to kind of understand like the search query logs and stuff. Uh, and then, then moved into like an ML infrastructure engineer. Um, at LinkedIn, and then uh, and then after about a year, like a year and a half or so, uh, like switch teams and and then join like the recommendations team at LinkedIn, and then like since then I've been working, I mean like mostly on machine learning. Uh, then uh, I worked on like the search quality or the search ranking team at Google, and then uh, and then like an uh, I mean and then as an NLP engineer at SJ, and then now like back to recommendations here at Facebook or Meta. That's great. It's cool to hear uh, different paths from the two of you. Um, Frank, you're up next. Um, yeah, cool. So hi, I'm Frank. Um, so as Jake said, I, my first job was had nothing to do with uh, machine learning. I was a uh, sophomore in college. And then basically what happened was that I was sort of working in Andrew Eng's lab um, once the summer of my freshman year. And then you know, basically doing machine learning research. But back then, you know, I was a freshman in college. I didn't know anything about machine learning. And what happened was that Andrew basically walked in and said, you know, I heard you guys know how to build a website. You so stop doing your research and help me build this website instead. So that led to, you know, me and a, a few of my friends uh, in the lab uh, joining Coursera when they started. So I actually had not, not a lot of background in machine learning. Uh, at Stanford, my, uh, both my bachelor's and my master's was in systems. Um, uh, computer systems, uh, like operating systems and compilers and, stuff, and, and, and so on. So after I left Coursera, I was sort of, you know, well, the machine learning field, this is back in 2016, 27, it was really beginning to blow up. Um, so I decided, okay, cool. I probably should look for something along this field instead. And so I decided I didn't know a lot about machine learning, but at that point I knew something about systems. So I decided, so in the end, I found a, uh, like um, I found a position uh, in Google Brain working on TensorFlow and TPUs, which are Google's uh, machine learning uh, accelerators at that time, because they are transitioning off NVIDIA to uh, to uh, their own chips. Uh, so I so worked on worked on those things for four years. So that's how I got to be uh, in machine learning, uh, in particular on the infrastructure side. I saw, spent a bit of time doing research, but a lot of my time was spent like you know making say ResNet go faster or making, you know, uh, like Google's like cores of the machine learning, um, machine learning and deep learning models go faster. So a lot of this is spent, uh, a lot of my time is spent on, you know, what's really now called machine, uh, machine learning engineering rather than, you know, machine learning research. Yeah. So that's how I got to be in, in this field. Uh, cool. 
That's great. Um, well, maybe um, it's really cool to hear your different backgrounds and paths into ML. So Frank and systems engineering and Kaushik and applied machine learning and um, Selvi and I guess data science and different paths. But uh, really, yeah, it's, it's 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 cool to hear that the different paths have led you all to be successful and um, but different education trainings. Maybe I'll I'll start I'll pivot on your um, your grad school. Um, so for someone who's interested in ML, like um, maybe I'd love to hear different perspectives. Uh, do you need a PhD? Um, how do you think about that? Um, and, and maybe talk about your own grad school choices. Anyone, this is a popcorn question. Um, so uh, Kasha, you look ready to jump in. <laughs> uh, I can start first. Uh, I don't think you need a PhD to, uh, to work on applied ML in industry. Uh, I think, and I would say most of, uh, or I would say like quite a few folks in the industry, they don't have a PhD uh, who are working on applied ML. I think uh, if you if you look at uh, applied ML from industry, you can kind of break it down into five broad problems or tasks. I would say uh, like the first, I mean, when you're starting to work on any problem, you kind of do some analysis or like an opportunity sizing. That's the first part. Then you then you work on like a data preparation, uh, trying to prepare your data set for um, like training. So that's the second part. The third part would be the modeling part where I uh, where you go and create a model uh, to to train the data set. Then fourth would be evaluation uh, where you where you evaluate against the current like the baselines of production, and then the fifth would be experimentation. Uh, the reason I say that is as you can see, like the modeling or the ML part is probably probably like one fifth of it and you would probably spend an appropriate amount of time in modeling as well. But there is there is um there are there are about four or five things that kind of go hand in hand with it for you to for you to build uh an ML like a product uh that's uh that's like serving users. So uh and this doesn't even come into the online infrastructure and then like deploying and serving and stuff. So um I would say, um, I, I would say, I would say for anyone to have like a like a firm understanding of kind of kind of like a various stages of a pipeline, and uh, you know, like uh, and then trying to and then trying to trying to iterate on the quality of each and every one of them, uh, it, like it's kind of like a necessary skill to uh, to kind of excel uh, as an ML engineer in industry. Great, you just saved me some money. Thank you, Kashik. Um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, uh, Shelby. Um, I guess one thing you talked about sort of the mathematics um, foundations and sort of what are different pathways people can um, potentially get the some of the the math background to. You know, it's obviously just a part of the job, but um, as you mentioned, sort of foundational for a lot of the work. Like, how, how what are different pathways you've seen people to get that background? Uh, yes, so. Um, so I, I understand that anyone can work on building machine learning models because we now we have Python libraries for that. So it's not a big problem doing that. But in order to understand what's going on inside a classifier, let's say, we should know the mathematics behind at least. I, I agree with that. So um, that's why I would say so there are lots of YouTube channels from where I also made my foundations much clearer because in my bachelor's, I was not in touch with mathematics so much except probability and so on but then later I needed to get in touch with statistics and everything so for that um, I usually used to watch one of the channel called three blue one brown from YouTube and that was really really helpful for me at first and later on if you if someone is not doing masters they can also go with some machine learning courses and then I think it's easy to follow. Great. Um, yeah, we are we are fans of that YouTube channel as well. Um, and uh, um, hopefully answered the the question in the Q and A with that. Cool. Um, awesome. All right. Well, let me let me get practical for a second. Maybe um, I'll, uh, I'll I'll actually kick it to Kashik. Um, so you know, let's start with resumes. This is getting very practical. <laughs> um, but there's yeah. some studies that saying like you know you as a hiring manager maybe you're at Meta and you get um, you know I don't know tons of resumes and uh, studies say maybe you spend 15 seconds on a resume. Um, so um, maybe that's true, maybe that's not true, but it's certainly sort of you're, you're using some sort of heuristics to look at things. So 
um, when you're, what do you look for in figuring out if there's a, a match for your team in your org? Um, so people sort of thinking about resumes and how to position themselves. Yeah, um, I'd say um, in terms of skills, uh, I would say like a practical knowledge of uh, applying uh, ML uh, to like to build products. Uh, and this is something that uh, I would say most people in the industry after talking to a candidate for about half an hour of, or kind of like kind of like 45 minutes will be able to figure out if uh, they've had some uh, experience in 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 like solving problems. And this is something that I feel like you can't get from books or you can't get from uh, like a theoretical knowledge. Uh, I think while it's like super critical to have that, I think uh, like once you get into the industry, uh, you learn uh, w w one thing you will learn is also understand that there are quite a few things that are constantly changing. Say, for example, uh, when in 2014, 20, in about 2015, uh, we were applying like logistic regression or like booster decision trees uh, at LinkedIn uh, to solve problems. But uh, now uh, quite a few techniques have like kind of moved towards like the wide and deep networks, uh, uh, you know, even to solve the same, uh, you know, even to solve the same sort of problems that we were doing. So I'd say, um, during interviews, we don't look out for usually any particular techniques uh, that, they've, that they've used, but I think what's more important is uh, that the approach that they took, why did they why did they take the approach and what do they think they could have gotten better? So like in some sort of like a, um, I think kind of to test their practical knowledge on like solving problems um, and also, and also what do they do when things don't work the first time, which is, you know, like kind of which is often the case uh, in the industry as well. That's great. Um, so it sounds like just to play back some of that, if, if you were preparing for an interview, um, maybe with you, Kosh, I could sort of really yeah. sort of thinking about it, some key, key examples when, you know, you had to build products and, and really just sort of almost thinking through the case, like how did we go through Maybe it's the five steps you said around like, yeah. you know, is this a big opportunity? How do we model it? How do we evaluate? Like what, you know, what roadblocks we we hit and how did we solve them? Is that sort of some advice on sort of preparing for an uh, yeah. analogy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think having a good theoretical foundation uh, is definitely like, I mean, like necessary and it helps, but also uh, I would say like start solving problems. Right? Like, I mean, I mean, I mean, like take projects that, where where you can solve them end to end, uh, and then and then try to iterate on those problems, and then try to uh, like you know like improve your accuracy or uh, I mean improve your performance uh, in like whatever way possible. And then uh, I think even you will find that let's say if you worked on the problem for about three or four iterations, uh, there are certain like tips or techniques that you learn that doesn't work for certain cases and things that you learn that works better for certain cases. And, um, and then, and then that will also help you get a better understanding of the concepts as well. And, uh, it will, it will also help you in, in like doing well in your job, like once you get the interview. That's great. Um, how about, um, how about you, Frank, like when you think about, um, you know, your as your interviewer hat on, um, and maybe you can speak to a little bit of um, what it's like to, uh, I don't know, interview at a startup, and maybe think about the matching of uh, what people can consider as sort of the, you know, whether they're better suited to thinking about an Amazon, a Facebook, a Google, or you know, you've worked at both types of companies, um, smaller startups as well. So sort of maybe think about the matchmaking process that's involved of trying to figure out where's the best place to take your career, small, smaller companies or bigger companies. Yeah. So I really do think that people should have experience in both startups and larger companies. Um, those are, you know, fundamentally, they are very different businesses, right? If you're going to um, Google or you're going to Meta or you're going to Netflix or Amazon, you're probably, you know, working alongside, um, you know, dozens or, you know, your your, your team right, might be like dozens of people. So it's like really, 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 really big. You're probably, especially if you're like um, entry level, 
uh, if you are just you know graduated from your master's degree from your college, uh, you're probably going to be working on like a tiny bit of you know like a much larger system, whether it be like you know YouTube recommendations or whether it be uh, even you know like on the stuff that I'm most familiar with on like um, machine learning systems on you know on TensorFlow on Jax on PyTorch, you're going to be working on a tiny bit of it. Um, but what and you know and the iteration cycles will be a, a lot longer. But once you get a feature delivered, you know, like um, a lot of people will use it, or if you get a, you know, even, you know, 0.1% improvement in some metric on say um, YouTube recommendations, that is, that actually improves uh, the quality of recommendations for a lot of people. So, um, so iteration cycles are, are, are sort of long, you know, it's like, um, you might encounter, you know, a bit more, you know, bureaucracy, a lot of meetings, uh, a lot of approvals to actually get your things to launch. But on the other hand, um, a lot of, uh, but on the other hand, a lot of this is going to be, um, is, is that there's going to be a lot of uh, impactful work just by the sheer scale of uh, the products that um, these companies put out. Um, on the other hand, on, in a startup, especially if you're looking to join an early stage startup, you know, there's still a lot of them in the uh, machine learning AI field. Um, iteration cycles will be a lot faster. Everyone is, you know, trying to get product market fit. Everyone is trying to, um, try, try, trying to, you know, uh, get to, you know, at least get to cash flow positive before they have to, you know, raise money or, you know, everyone is in constant fundraising mode. So it's a very sort of, it's a, a lot more hectic. But I, in some sense, it's a lot more fun because you get to build a lot. You get to build a lot more things a lot quicker than if you were to actually than than at a big company. So I think it's like um, if you are if if some I assume some of you you know for, from the introductions you know some of you are still in school, so you should probably you know now would be actually a good time to actually just try out you know just take an internship at a big company and then take an internship at a startup and then now and then you will and then. Hopefully that will allow uh, help you figure out whether you know being at a big company is more suitable to you know your personality and your lifestyle. Being at a smaller company, being at a startup, is more suitable. So I think this is probably a good opportunity um, for someone who is already in you know like um, uh, like in in the workplace. That obviously that's going to be harder. But you know even just coming to these events, you know just talking to your friends or working at larger companies, working at smaller companies. Um, would help you get a sense of, you know, what their working style is like and, you know, how busy they are and if they're working overtime and things like that. Um, so, yeah, just, you know, talk. A, a lot of this is just, a lot of it is like talk to people and try to figure out um, what, you, what you want. And I guess the other thing I want to say is that, um, you know, in machine learning, you know, Kaushik and, and um, Xiaowi has talked about the modeling aspect, you know, the actual machine learning research part. But, you know, a lot of the sort of, if you want to be in machine learning, you can also, for people like me, right, with no like academic machine learning or academic like data science background, the, the way to do it is just, you know, there, there is a lot of uh, engineering requirement around, you know, getting machine learning systems into production. So if you just have a software engineering background, the best way to, you know, get into this field is to just, you know, be, um, just to like start looking into job roles where it's just machine learning engineering, because a lot of that is just, being a good software engineer rather than, you know, I need to know a lot of math or I need to, you know, uh, do, you know, I need to have published papers and things like that. I've done, you know, I, I don't think I know a lot of math and I've never published a machine learning paper. So, <laughs> but, you know, uh, yeah, I was at Google Brain. So, you know, so it's like there are a lot of opportunities all over for if you are actually interested in the field. Uh, cool. Very cool. Yeah, I think that, that advice of um, working in, adjacent roles or you know where you get a lot of exposure um but maybe you do something that you're you have more background in and you can add value right away but sort of also have the balance of learning new things um is sort of i think pretty good advice for a lot of people moving into roles um uh so maybe um shelby I'll, I'll go to you um around the sort of the practicality mm -hmm. of preparing uh, for interviews and you know I know and you're probably reading leaving grad school and joining the workforce and doing different things you're sort of spending time um, finishing your work and, and getting internships but also preparing um, you know and there's so many different skills required and there's you know statistics and engineering and math and machine learning background like how do you how did you even think about um, spending and balancing your time for inter interview prep and all those different areas if you're meant to be uh, uh, fluent in, in several of them. 
Yes, so it was really hard. Uh, when I was doing my master's, I was also working. Like I said, uh, I was doing, I was working as a data scientist at Allianz part time. Um, it was really hard to balance everything. Um, also, um, making the foundation for the concepts and also working practically, just like Koshik and Frank said. Um, so working on different projects uh, in the university, working uh, also on different challenges, for example, on Kaggle, so as to make my concepts much clearer. Um, but uh, what I used to do was I used to do one thing at a time and do not think about other things as well. So that, that really helped me actually focusing on just what you are doing and pr properly managing what you want to do. If you don't manage it, it will be total chaotic, right? So that's why it was really helpful for me to focus on one thing that I'm doing and then think about the other things when you are doing it. And that's how I could manage like multiple things going on at the moment, uh, at the time I was doing my master's. Um, cool, anyone else, um, Kashik or Frank, like thinking about um, how you prepared for, for new roles and in interviews? Uh, in terms of preparing for interviews, I would say, uh, I, I, I mean, for, for most ML engineer roles, you can kind of divide your interview into like a software engineering interview and then an ML engineering interview. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to focus on the ML engineering interview part of it. Uh, I would say, uh, just like brushing up on like some of the fundamentals, uh, because you might have been a bit rusty or you have not like used them like for a while uh those are good practices uh i mean and also looking at the you know like the uh, i mean say for example if you're interviewing um at a company let's say like linkedin or like meta just just like going over their problems uh and then see and i mean and then i mean and then thinking through like where ml is like most used in those problems i mean say if it uh i mean say if you take like YouTube, uh, I think like I think like YouTube recommendations uh, is like the you know like like it's like the predominant use case, and then just think about let's say let's say if if like you are an engineer who's asked to solve the YouTube recommendations, well, I mean like what would you do? I mean like what are the problems that you're seeing in YouTube recommendations right now? How do you think you can fix it from the ML side? Uh, then you can go with search as well, like the YouTube search. So like uh, just like brainstorming a couple of problems that are that are that are like relevant to the company that you're interviewing for. And then um, just doing a background on the common techniques to solve those problems. Uh, and then also try to wear your product hat and see what are the common problems that as an end user that like that like that like you are facing right now in these problems. I mean in these products and then and then and then and then coming back to ML hat on how you can solve these problems from like a machine learning point of view. Great. Um, there's a, a couple uh, questions coming in, so let me pay attention to those. Um, so um, maybe, yeah, one question um, from Rainier and thinking about, you know, the sort of concept of reproducing papers. Um, so maybe like this idea of like starter starter projects. Um, um, you know, maybe you won't, you don't have an ML job right now, so you don't have a data set, or you don't have a work that you can work on. Like, what what would it, um, advice you'd give to people to sort of start to, you know, get hands on if 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 they're not in the current role? Um, maybe I'll, I don't know, Frank or Shelby, anyone wants to answer that? I would say, like, I mean, like, take a course at Codex. Uh, <laughs> as uh, and, and then I mean, plan it, then plan it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, else, uh, I mean, also, uh, this is like like Kaggle, where uh, you know, there's uh, there is like there's like like uh, like a real data sets uh, available, and then you can go and like practice problems, and then uh, I mean, and then submit to the leaderboards and click to evaluate yourselves. Um, I think once you're once you're more familiar, you can also go to existing papers and then just see, I mean, and, I mean, and then see the data sets that they're using in those papers. And then you can take the same data sets. Uh, the, the, the kind of the advantage of doing that is you'll have a good baseline on 
on what are the metrics that they are evaluating on and then and then and then like what is a good like a baseline value for this metric so like it's it, it's just easy to uh test your methods uh you know like can against his baseline okay Java, you unmuted were you going to say something uh, yes, I could only agree with Kaushik. So Kaggle actually is a very great platform there you have re real data set and challenge which, where you can solve problems. Um, and also um, reading a lot of papers and seeing their GitHub repository there, you will find a lot of how they approach the problem. And so performance metrics does not need to be always accuracy. It depends on the problem, right? And uh, based on that, you can, you can see how the papers that develop the performance metrics and how you can also work on it. It could be some business metric as well, depending on the company you are working in. Um, but just just so introduce that accuracy is not like always the perfect metric. There are associated other metric performance metrics as well. So the more you work on problems, the more you'll understand better, I think. That's great. All right, I'm gonna take another audience question. Um, an anonymous question. Um, is ML a young person's game? Um, so when you look around, do you only see uh, as young people or um, maybe talk about your work and um, uh, think about if you have know any examples of people that have transitioned to ML sort of later in their career that you've worked with or um, curious to, to get that answer to that question. Anyway, I'll toss it up. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Not, uh, I mean, I, I think in general, uh, it's not a young person's game um because like I, I don't think you know for that matter i also don't think software engineering is a young person's game so coming from a perspective of being a um being a software engineer you know working in uh, machine learning i don't think a lot of you know uh, I, I i don't think you know this is not like you know a competitive chess where you peak it by your mid 30 <laughs> mid 30s or something like that right so it's not um it is not going to be uh anything um it, it's not going to be anything similar um, I think it does. I, I think one of the things is that you do have to keep up with um, sort of, especially if you are in like research or if you are if you are in um, sort of you know sort of cutting edge stuff. You do have to keep up with you know new papers and things like that, and that can take uh, some more of your time. Uh, that can take more of your time in machine learning specifically, as opposed to say um, systems, right? Because in systems, you know the idea. The, Compilers haven't changed that much in the last 10 or 20 years compared to, you know, machine learning where, you know, a few years ago, we are all talking about, say, transformers, and now we are all talking about, you know, GBD3 and so on and so forth. So, and, and Lambda and all these are like much bigger models. So I think it's like to just keep up with the, like the, uh, the uh, new developments in the field is going to be um, taking up more of your time and, you know, you just have to budget for it, you know, but a lot of the um, I think almost all the researchers I know just spend a lot of time, you know, reading papers and re-implementing some of those papers and, you know, iterating on those papers. So I think this is just becomes part of their job description uh, rather than anything else. Yeah. Great. All right. Thanks, Frank. Um, one question, uh, maybe, I don't know, Kashik or whoever wants to answer. What, what do ML engineers actually do? <laughs> maybe is there an example that can bring to life? Um, uh, what you spend all your time doing and getting paid well to do. What, what, is it, what, is that, what does that, what does that mean? What's, what's give an example just so we can yeah. um, demystify it. Yeah. Uh, I can, I can probably, uh, like take that one. Uh, I think, I mean, like an example would be, would be, would be like YouTube. I would say, let's say if you go to youtube.com, uh, the, the order in which like the videos are right, uh, that's kind of decided by an ML engineer or, or by the work. Uh, of an ML engineer, um, the reason it's it's so critical is uh, you know like say, uh, I mean let's say let's say if you don't have them then you can go with a bunch of like a heuristics say say I'm gonna sort like the YouTube feed based on popularity or based on based on your past uh, engagements and I think uh, I think we have run numerous experiments to show that. Uh, trying to optimize for something that the user likes, uh, like it kind of has proved to produce like huge gains uh, to the metrics to the company. Uh, so I think, uh, and in terms of the actual task, uh, I would say, I mean, at least 
I mean, at least for me, uh, here at Facebook or Meta, I would say I can break it down into five tasks. Uh, I think uh, the first one would be in some sort of like an opportunity sizing for me to start working on a new project. Uh, I mean, is it worth my time uh, going to spend two months, three months? Uh, and then if I spend two or three months, uh, I, you know, kind of what is the opportunity in this project? So that's that's kind of like the first part of it. Uh, the second would be like the data preparation, then the modeling part, uh, then evaluation, uh, and then the experimentation, uh, and then followed by online infrastructure and deployment. So like th th these are the these are the like the various like the subsystems within uh, I mean like within ML engineering, uh, if I can call it uh, that, I touch upon. That's great. Maybe Shelly, while we're there, you could um, talk about an example from your work um, just to illuminate a little bit. Like, what is what is a day? What is an exciting day in the life? Of, maybe not an average day, but it's an exciting day in the life in, in terms of your role. So, in my uh, work, basically, we are mostly focusing on validating machine learning use case. So, during the day, there are lots of brainstorming sessions that we do, and then when we come up with certain approach, how to like approach this machine learning use case, first we validate whether we even need a machine learning in it or not. And if we think there is a requirement, then we think of how should we approach it and how should we build the model for it. And once the model is finalized, then we also do some business value assessment, some different performance metrics, comparisons, and then with regards to the baseline, some baseline that we have, and then finally we determine whether this machine learning model should go in production or not. So. That's all what I do in my job. And a day looks like lots and lots of brainstorming sessions and meetings and some uh, obviously development and research included. Great. Um, maybe Frank or someone um, to talk about just the ML upside, like it's obviously becoming a, a bigger and bigger part of the ML ecosystem and there's more jobs and maybe, maybe these titles mean different things at different companies, but there's certain to be a, a growing set of ML ops titles, but um, sort of maybe thinking about a starting point of like, you know, what does, what does someone ML ops do? And then um, maybe a starting point of how someone could learn more about the ML productionizing world. Right, and, right. yeah, because there are multiple roles in this yeah. in the industry, right? You have like yeah. a machine learning researcher or machine learning scientists, you know, at Google it's called, yeah, these roles are usually called um, research scientist roles. So those are, you know, sort of the typical roles when you think about, you know, Google Brain, when you think about, you know, uh, FAIR, for instance, when you think about, you know, parts of OpenAI, those people, you know, publish papers and then they sort of, you know, and, you know, basically they sort of come up with, you know, GPT-3 or DALI or Palm or, you know, any of the, the sort of large, uh, large models. So this is what they, so this is what they do. So they are sort of similar to in roles to like grad students or professors at, you know, academic research labs, but instead of, you know, uh, instead of having grad students do all the work, you know, you have lots of TPUs or GPUs to, to do the other work instead. Um, so those are research scientists. And then for, uh, uh, and then the second role is sort of machine learning uh, engineering, which is sort of, uh, and this is like sort of a very big um, sort of uh, spectrum of roles. You know, some machine learning engineers will work uh, closely with the research scientists to implement uh, the new models that they are, um, the, uh, that, that they have come up with, right? Because oftentimes these new models, so for instance, like Palm is like something like 540 billion parameters. So sometimes they would require a lot of engineering to get to work because, you know, you're not going to be able to train any of these models on one GPU or one TPU. So a lot of like distributed systems problems come up when you have, and you know, sometimes these engineers get their names onto the papers as well, because they have contributed so much to, you know, just getting the models to work, you know, to demonstrate that they actually are better. And then on the, and then some other ML engineers would, you know, are sort of more responsible for things like, you know, productionizing, you know, existing models, right? Because for instance, YouTube recommendations or, you know, search ranking or ads ranking, a lot of these models are not public, but, you know, so, uh, you still have people who need to, you know, to make sure that the data ingestion pipeline works to make sure that the training works to make sure that we can still serve uh, these models because, you know, all these models, if you just don't optimize the serving, it's just going to be really expensive or really slow. So, you know, a lot of um, uh, machine learning, like engineers also work around this. And then this sort of, and, and these sort of uh, roles all tie into like the larger sort of you know, DevOps and SREs 
and just normal sort of software engineering practices. So, you know, those are sort of separate roles. Uh, and then, you know, and when people talk about ML ops, they are sort of more referring to the sort of second set of people rather than the machine learning engineers who are working with research scientists. So, um, so basically ops just means, you know, operationalizing the um, ML model so that, you know, you can actually get business benefit out of um, out of basically using ML and, you know, not have, you know, models that, you know, don't work or, you know, models that cause crashes or models that take three seconds to come out the results when your deadline is 0 0.5 and so on and so forth. So a lot of like just making sure the models work and the models work well uh, falls under um, ML ops and machine learning engineering. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I, can, I know it can seem a little bit like alphabet soup and talking about different roles and different titles of different companies, but I think that was quite helpful in laying out the spectrum and different types of roles things. So thank you, Frank. Um, so maybe I'll take a question from uh, Rainier, sort of, uh, I guess the question is, you know, which areas of ML and um, deep learning you think sort of maybe easier to get started with? It sounds like some of the advice is to follow your interests and follow what's interesting to you. Um, but if there's a, a practical way to think about it, is there, you know, computer vision easier to get started for someone completely new um, or something else? Um, so maybe if you could address, someone could address that question. Well, I think the good thing like right now is there is like, there is a lot of convergence across fields. Uh, what I mean by that is like the techniques that you learn in one field uh, is probably not applicable only to that field these days. Like, I mean, I mean, like transformers is applicable. I mean, like started as an NLP. Uh, I mean, like like started within the NLP field, but then it's it's widely used in computer vision as well, uh, like through vision transformers, for example. And the same way, like, the conversation journal, which started as a computer vision, uh, the concept is also widely used in uh, like NLP these days. Um, so, from a skills or like a knowledge perspective, I think <clears throat> you're not limited to just the techniques that have learned in one field. Uh, I I also find like search to be an easier field to get started with. One, um, it's there is, I would say. I would say like search and computer vision would be uh, like easy fields to get started with uh, like like search because you can, uh, I mean, there's like a short query that's probably easily like understandable and uh, and then you can go and look at the results and uh, like, like it's easy to debug and like it right on that. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, well, I'll do one more plug to Corey. There's a, a great search track and what we found is that um, you know, a lot of people working in search have it don't have, you know, they didn't have a master's degree in search, right? Like, um, like there's, there's, there hasn't been a whole lot of training and to connect with, um, you know, experts in search and to, um, connect with other people at maybe working in those roles at other companies. It's, it's a really cool experience. And I think really like very high return on your learning investment. Um, cause you can, you know, not only are there roles available, but you can come back to your company, um, and, and really add a ton of value if you, uh, uh, if you can um, improve, you know, some small things with the search system. Um, so uh, just second that. Um, great. Um, well, I, uh, we're actually going to split out. J Judy, is that right? Um, I think we're going to split out in a few minutes, but, um, and I'll, there's a couple questions that we didn't answer, but I'll, I'll sort of figure out a good way for us to all connect. Um, so Frank, there was a specific question around preparing for, for Google brain interviews. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys have some fun on <laughs> fun on fun on that. Um, um, but uh, yeah, maybe maybe one one last question I'll have you guys answer is um, like it's so much is happening. Uh, how do you you know? And Frank mentioned some of this, but um, how do you keep up with trends? And like, what are, what's your what's your news feed look like? Or how do you spend time in the day? Pick your head up from the urgent needs of the business to to sort of pay attention to what's what's happening and what you can maybe bring back to your work. Uh, Shelby, I don't know if you have thoughts on that question. So basically, I really like like subscribing to certain news, let's say for big companies, Google or Meta, and thereby I read what's going on in the technology. Um, and I am also connected with SAP blogs. Um, with CoreEyes, anyways, we are providing so many good courses that are very much related to what real the 
recent technology is about. And in my job description, uh, the work I'm doing there also, there are, we need to study lots of paper and we are all, always focused on mostly the new technology and not the old ones, which due to some reason didn't work out. Um, so that's how at least I keep myself updated. Frank, you always have a couple monitors up at one time. But, uh... <laughs> uh, I think a lot of it is following, it is, might be like following Twitter and things like that, just following a researchers that you might, um, you know, people post, you know, interesting things or retweet interesting things. Um, obviously I couldn't, you know, possibly, you know, go, go, go into archive and read all the papers, but, you know, sometimes just skimming what other people are saying will, will actually be helpful. And if it actually comes out of my work in the future, you know, yeah, I can always go back and read it. Yeah. That's great. Um, all right. Well, um, Judy, are you there? I think. Yes. Yeah, think... for a sec, I couldn't find the mute button, but yeah, I'm here. Um, <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, well, I think we're, um, I'm, I'm, I've, I could pack another hour into this, but um, I think we're at time. Um, and like I said, I'll, I'll we'll sort of make some of these connections, but um, uh, thank you so much for the questions. And uh, you made my job easier as a moderator to have uh, really useful questions. And, 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 and Kashik, Shelby, and Frank, uh, really appreciate your time and uh, to really help people think about their different options and how to transition from where they are to an ML career. So uh, thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, you three. So uh, this event is, the first part is public for everyone, but now we're going into the private part, which is we do have our uh, current ML track students and we're going to give 15 minutes to them uh, for a private breakout with the three panelists. And so if you are a current track student, and I see some folks here, Emily, Eric, Scott, Josh, uh, Maggie, you can stay too. You took two of the three courses. Maggie took one of the courses in track, loved it so much, and then bought the, the rest of the track. Um, so you know who you are. If you're in track, please stay. And then the rest of you, thank you so much for coming. And uh, we'll share out a recording of this first part soon. Thanks, everyone.